Welcome to this tutorial on performing high throughput molecular dynamics with Galaxy. The aim of this video is to provide you with an introduction to molecular dynamics simulation and analysis, and in particular using the Galaxy Data Analysis platform. Uh, my name is Simon Bray from the University of Freiburg in Germany, and this presentation has been prepared together with Chris Barnett from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and Trin Dusanipati from the University of Sri Jayawadayapura in Sri Lanka. So a brief word about the structure of the video. It will be split into two parts, the first on molecular dynamics simulation by me, and the second on MD analysis by Chris. Uh, I will start by giving a very basic 10 minute introduction to MD simulation, followed by a demonstration in Galaxy. Um, I'll also show you how we can implement high throughput MD simulations using Galaxy's concepts of workflows and collections. Uh, then Chris will do the same for analysis, and give a short introduction to the concepts behind MD analysis, followed by a demonstration in Galaxy. Uh, there are no strict prerequisites for this tutorial, but it would be good if you have some basic knowledge of the Galaxy platform. We might explain basic features in this video. Um, if, if you want to get yourself up to speed, we recommend following the Galaxy 101 for Everyone tutorial, which you can find linked on the website of the, of, of the Galaxy Train network. All right, let's get started with the first part, an introduction to MD simulation. So molecular dynamics, as you may well know, is a computational technique for molecular simulation. Um, and the reason why we are generally interested to, to use it is that it provides a very high level of temporal and spatial resolution in comparison with um, the large number of experimental methods, which um, are also used to provide information about um, the positions or the motions of, um, of atoms and molecules. So for example, we can use uh, techniques such as X-ray crystallography, which provide um, a very high spatial resolution, but essentially a static picture of the molecule. They, they don't show the motion. Or we can use techniques like um, FRET, for example, which gives us some information about um, how the molecule changes in time, but not at a very high temporal resolution. And um, MD simulation allows us um, to leave the world of experiments and to um, simulate as long as we have sufficient compute resources at um, unlimited temporal and um, spatial resolution. So, so that is more or less the, the, the rationale, the reason why we are interested in MD. The principle is that we um, are simulating the atomic motion with um, Newtonian physics. So in general, more, um, more precise methods which involve quantum mechanics are not involved. So now a very brief introduction to um, the physics behind molecular dynamics. So um, like I just mentioned on the previous slide, um, MD um, works on the basis of classical mechanics. So we treat the bonds and atoms in the system um, as um, point masses connected by, by springs, and therefore we can treat them um, as simple harmonic oscillators. The atoms also have a charge which is associated uh, with them and um, for each time step, we, um, we can calculate the, 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 the potential energy U, which is made up of two components, the intermolecular uh, potential energy and the intramolecular uh, component. So um, these are the interactions between molecules and also within individual molecules. And then um, over the course of a single time step, so a typical length would be on the order of um, a femtosecond, so 10 to the minus 15 seconds. We can calculate um, all of the forces um, which are acting on, um, on each of the atoms um, from the potential energy. And um, if we know these forces, we can then calculate um, how the positions of the atoms change over um, the course of our time step. And then um, at the end of this time step, we have um, a new structure with new positions we can repeat this process um, for thousands or for millions of times. And in this way, we accumulate a so-called uh, trajectory, which is just a sequence of these um, frames. So you can view what we do here as collecting a video, which um, shows the motion of all of the atoms in the system um, over time. And one consequence of this, which I think is quite well known, is that MD has a high computational cost. So if you're dealing with um, a system of with thousands of um, atoms or even millions, then um, to calculate all of this just for a single time step is already um, computationally very costly. And if we're dealing with um, 
millions of time steps, which we need to get to um, a substantial trajectory length, then um, the computational cost um, it gets very high. So there are plenty of applications of ND, so we will focus mostly on ND of um, protein ligand systems, how protein ligands interact with each other, but um, it can also be used to study, for example, protein folding, conformational changes in protein, but it also has applications in uh, material science. One thing that we want to focus on particularly in this tutorial is how we can scale up um, our ND simulation and analysis to a high throughput level. So we're not simply calculating simulation of a single ligand, but we can calculate, say, for, for 10 or 100 ligands against the same protein um, in a single run. This is something which the work for management system that we're using, Galaxy, is particularly well suited for. So there are a lot of questions that you have to think about when setting up an ND study, and these will be discussed in the um, tutorial. You have to think about how to um, parameterize your protein and your ligand. Um, these have to be done in two separate steps, as we'll explain. Uh, generally, you want to think about solvent because biochemistry takes place in the solvent, that is water. Should we add um, particles with charges, sodium ions, chloride ions, for example? Um, is the water equilibrated around the system? We generally include um, special preliminary simulations to ensure that the water is correctly um, equilibrated. Is the system starting from an energetically minimized state? Um, something that we also need to consider. And um, finally, you might finish your simulation, but what do you want to do with it next? You want to perform some kind of analysis, and then you would, might want to think about things like RMSD, RMSF, um, PCA. Um, and we will guide you through some of these techniques um, later on. So to turn now to Galaxy, there are a wide variety of open source tools which are available in Galaxy for, um, molecular, sim for molecular simulation. So you'll be using um, Chromax in the tutorial and for analysis tools such as such as ND analysis and Bio3D. You can access these tools via the European Galaxy server, which you can access at cheminformatics.usegalaxy.eu. That's what we recommend for this tutorial. There is also a um, South African server Link is provided on the screen. You're welcome to try that out as well. And to launch your own Galaxy server is also pretty straightforward. So if you're interested in doing this and um, uh, making use of your own compute resources, then um, you can also try this out. So what you see on the screen is the is the web page of the of the Galaxy server that we'll be using for this training session. Cheminformatics.usegalaxy.eu. Uh, so um, we assume that you have an account there and um, that you can just log in and um, either follow the, the steps in the video or you can follow the training material um, by yourself. Okay, so to get to the training material, you click on this little hat symbol at the top of the screen and you'll see this page. So then navigate to computational chemistry and then high throughput molecular dy dynamics and analysis. Um, so this is the page which describes the whole of the training that we'll be going through um, in this video. Um, we have an introductory section which um, provides some background information about the protein that we'll be simulating, this um, heat shot protein 90. Um, so it's a chaperone protein which is involved in um, helping to fold proteins um, after synthesis. Um, and so there's some background information about this, which is um, not crucial for this tutorial, but maybe nice for you to have a read through uh, if you're interested. Um, we have a, a, um, a diagram of um, HSP90 with a ligand bound, and um, you can click to view it in the, um, in the NDL viewer, which is um, embedded into galaxies. So let's get on with starting the analysis. So the first step is to collect the protein structure of the HSP90 protein. So um, we can do this using the um, using the get PDB tool, which is available in Galaxy. So just um, take this accession code, um, 6HHR, 
which refers to the protein structure, and then let's find the tool. So it's a very simple tool. You just paste it in to the PDB accession code field and press on execute. So already we have the uh, the data set appear in our history in, in our history panel. Um, so we can rename the data set already to something sensible. Okay, so now our PDB file has successfully been loaded into Galaxy. So let's continue with the next step, which is which is preparation of um, of the um, of the topology that we need for simulating. So, as described in the training material, we have to do this in um, two separate steps um, for both the protein coordinates and the and the ligand coordinates. Uh, so, first of all, what is topology generation? So the simulation software that we're using, uh, Gromax, um, makes a distinction between the constant and the dynamic attributes of the atoms in the system. So constant attributes would be things like um, atomic charge, the bonds which connect the atoms, and the dynamic attributes are things like the positions of the atoms, um, or the velocities or the forces which are associated with atoms, uh, which can change during the course of the simulation. And the Gromax software expects that the constant attributes are stored in the topology file, so this uh, top file, and the dynamic attributes are stored in um, structure files, so PDB files or GROW files. Um, and the PDB file has some of this information, um, but not everything that we need. So we have to um, carry out an explicit um, step in which we calculate these parameters for both the um, for both the protein and the ligand. And here's a small question which you might want to have a think about. Uh, why do the protein and the ligand need to be parameterized uh, separately? And you can click on the solution to find the answer. So the first thing that we need to do, uh, because we want to treat them separately, is to separate the coordinates of the ligand and the protein into two separate files. So um, if you look at the contents of the PDB file, then um, the atoms of the protein are all labeled as atom and the non-protein atoms are labeled as as het atom or um, hetero atom so this includes both the solvent molecules so so the waters here hoh but also the ligand agb5e so to form this um, separation of the coordinates into two separate files we can use one of the text manipulation tools search in text files um, so all this does is it searches all, all the lines in the input file and it finds lines that match a particular pattern then it will um, save them in the output so first of all to collect the um, the lines um, to, to collect atoms associated with the protein into a single file, then we um, choose, uh, first of all, our, um, our input file as the input. Uh, we select don't match, and then under regular expression, uh, we type het atom. So this will ensure that the um, output contains only lines um, in our file, which are not heteroatoms. So in other words, only the protein. Um, okay, so in the next step, we want to also um, separate the, the the ligand atoms out of our um, initial PDB file. So um, once again, let's use the search and text files tool to do that. Um, first thing to be careful about here is to use this PDB file, our original one, rather than um, protein only PDB file which we've just created and now we um, want now lines that match um, the uh, code of the ligand so that's AQ5E as stated in the tutorial and we just click on execute and then again let's give them sensible names so um, 
so I'm not taking any of the PDB file. Okay, so we've now completed um, this step and we have to now calculate the, the topologies for both protein and ligand. So um, for the protein, we use this uh, Gromax initial setup tool, which I'll show you now. So if you search for Gromax, then this will provide all of the tools um, which based on the Chromax software, and we choose this one, Chromax Initial Setup. And uh, we want to choose the protein-only PDB file as our, as our input. Um, for water model, we have various options which are available. Um, so this is a so-called um, three-point model, um, which means that the water is um, modeled by three different charges, so one on the oxygen atom and one on each of the hydrogen atoms. But there are also um, four and five point um, versions, which um, also place the charge, for example, on the on the lone pairs of the oxygen. Um, for the force field, again, we have multiple options. We will choose the, the Amber 99SB force field, um, quite a recent one, but um, again, there are multiple options um, that you can use. But we recommend that certainly that you use an Amber force field because um, because the tool that we use for the ligand topology will also generate amber um, topologies. Okay, so then we can just click on execute. And then we um, create three different files, which um, I'll explain to you when the, when the job is complete. Right, so now we have the task of generating a topology for the ligand. So for this, we use the AC pipe tool, um, since it provides um, an interface to Amber tools, and it also has the nice benefit that it gives us an output in a format which um, is required by Gromax. And as an initial step, we have to add hydrogen atoms to the ligand, because if we look at the PDP file, we will see that these are missing currently. Um, so we can do this using um, the compound conversion tool. So under output format, we can just select PDB. And we um, choose 7.4 as the pH at which to add the hydrogen atoms. We simply press on execute. Okay, so now we have our ligand PDB um, with the hydrogen atoms. And we can check quickly to see that the hydrogen atoms have indeed been included. In the output, the next step is to um, run the AC pipe tool itself. So it's this one here, we'll generate MD topologies for small molecules using AC pipe. And as input file, we take um, this data set, ligand PDB with hydrogens. Um, the charge of the molecule is zero. Um, multiplicity is one, which should be correct for um, almost all organic molecules. And um, under force field, we select GAF. So GAF stands for General Amber Force Field, which is a force field which is um, applicable to almost all small organic molecules. And then charge method, um, we can select simply as BCC, which is the default option. And um, we want to save the profile, because we need this for our simulation. And then we press on execute. Okay, so now that that job has completed, I can say something about the output files of the Gromax setup tool and the AC pipe tool. So for the Gromax setup tool, we have three outputs. We have this top output, this uh, topology. We have this grow output, which contains um, the coordinates of all the atoms, similar to the PDB file. And we have um, this ITP file, which is a position which is a position restraint file that we can use um, later on in the equilibration steps. Then again, for the ligand, we have um, a topology file, and we have this 
profile, which, which contains the coordinates of atoms. As for the um, topology, if I'll show you quickly the contents of the living topology, it contains um, various information, um, not about the positions or coordinates of atoms, but um, about, for example, their charge, their, uh, their mass, um, the different bonds which exist between, between atoms, um, uh, angles, dihedrals. Um, so this is information which is also um, uh, required for our simulation. All right. So having now calculated ligand and protein grow in top files, we now need to combine them back together again. And there is a tool for this in Galaxy, the um, merge grow and top files. Uh, so the tool has four different input files. First of all, the protein topology file, um, which is this one. The ligand topology file, which is this one here. The protein structure or the protein growth file, which is this data set and the, um, and the ligand growth file, which is this one here. So I can just press execute to start the job. So after we've combined the protein and ligand grow in top files to create a single unified um, grow file and a single top file, and the next step is to create a simulation box around the system in which the simulation can take place. So we can do this with the GOMAX uh, structure configuration tool. So again, um, quite a straightforward tool. We take this growth file as an input. We want to configure the box and we want to select one nanometer here. So this is the distance um, between the edge of the protein and the outside of the box. Um, so we can um, be sure that um, our, pro our protein is at all times um, this distance from the edge of the simulation box. Um, the different box types that you can represent that you can use. Um, the triclinic is the most efficient one, so um, we will use that. So the next step is solvation to add solvent to the box that we've just created. So once again, we have quite a simple tool for the um, solvation. We have to select our grow and top files. So we select the two that we um, produced from the uh, merge tool. We have to select a water, a water model, so we have three options here. We select um, the three-point model because that's what, what we used for the initial setup of the protein topology. We want to add ions to neutralize the system in case we have a net charge. And we have the choice also to specify a salt concentration to add. In this case, I believe it is zero, but you could also consider um, setting this to 0 0.1 moles per litre um, or something similar. And then I will press execute to um, start the tool. So having now completed solvation and created the simulation box, the next step is energy minimization. So the aim here is to ensure that the system is in the lowest possible energy state. Um, so we conduct a short simulation and um, wait until it reaches that state. Okay. So we have a specialized um, Chromax energy minimi uh, minimization tool. Um, once again, we need to provide growing top files. So um, we provide the grow file from the, um, which we just created with the, um, with, the uh, with the box and the solvated top um, file from before. Uh, sorry. Uh, this one, the solvated top. Then um, we have a choice whether we upload our own NDP file. So in, so in Gromax, you have these NDP files which contain parameters for the simulation. And you can also choose um, this customizable option. So there are various parameters which we can mostly leave as their defaults. Um, 
can set the number of steps to 50,000 and the uh, EM tolerance to um, 1,000. So the idea is, is that um, the simulation will begin as soon as um, the maximum force in the MD simulation is smaller than, than this value, then the simulation will end prematurely, or else if it reaches 50,000 steps, then it will end. Um, so let's press execute. So having completed the energy minimization step, um, we now need to check that the minimization simulation has actually converged. In other words, that it's actually reached um, the minimized state. So there's a, um, a Galaxy tool also for doing this, uh, extract energy components um, with Chromax. And so I'll show that to you now. So for this, we need to take the EDR file, which is an output of the energy minimization. And um, there are various um, terms that you can calculate. So in this case, um, the correct one is the, is, is the default, the potential. If you want to select um, a Galaxy tabular, the output format, and then we just press on execute. Okay. I'll just show you the contents quickly. So it shows all of the time steps of the simulation. Um, and uh, the potential energy of the system in the second column. So we can plot this. So if we go to the history now and click on this icon here, uh, visualize this, this data. Then we can choose to plot a line chart. So you can choose one here. Um, line chart JQ plot. And um, we have to um, select the axes. So for the x-axis, um, we plot column one. The y-axis, we plot column two. And then what we see here is this kind of um, curve, which at first decreases rapidly and then starts to decrease more slowly. You can see here that because it's leveling out, um, the system is reaching um, a minimized state. So you could maybe even leave it um, to continue the, the, the simulation for a little bit longer. So it flattens out completely, but um, the system is more or less minimized. So if we had just seen a steep descending curve, um, like at the start, then it would indicate that, um, that the simulation had not reached um, a minimized state. So having checked that, we can now continue with the next step, which is the um, equilibration. Okay, so now we've completed the energy minimization. We can continue with, um, with the ND simulations. So in this tutorial, we carry out um, three simulations, two so-called equilibration simulations, and then a production simulation. So the production sim um, simulation is the, is the real simulation that you can then go on and use in the analysis stage. So what does the um, equilibration, first of all, involve? So um, what we want to ensure is that the solvent around the protein is um, correctly e equilibrated. In other words, um, we want to um, ensure that it's brought to the correct temperature and to the correct pressure. So for that reason, we conduct um, the, the, the equilibration in two different stages under the NVT and the MVT ensembles. So NVT stands for uh, constant number of particles, constant volume and constant temperature. Whereas NVT stands for constant number of particles, constant pressure and uh, constant temperature. And as stated in the, in the tutorial, you might also see these terms uh, isothermal isochoric for the NVT ensemble or isothermal isobaric ensemble for the NPT ensemble. Um, so um, to carry out the equilibration, we have to um, hold the, the, the protein in place. Um, and we can do this using the, uh, the position restraint file that was created in the system setup. So the idea here 
is the position restraint file states which atoms have to be held in place. And then during the MD simulation, um, these atoms are allowed to move, but the motion is energetically penalized. So let's go ahead and um, start the first um, equilibration simulation. So we can search for the um, GOMAX simulation tool. It's this one here, uh, GROMAX simulation for system equilibration or data collection. And um, once again, we select the GROW structure file and the top file. So the GROW file is this one from the, from the energy minimization, and the top file is just this solvated top file that we created earlier. So now we have various inputs to select. Um, so for the checkpoint file, this is our first simulation. So we don't have a checkpoint file. I'll explain that and what this is in a second. For the position restraint file, I have to scroll down to the bottom of um, our history. And for the GOMAX initial setup tool that we created right at the start, there should be an ITP file. So this one here, which we use. Um, the index file we can also leave blank. That would be if you, if you wanted to specify some um, some custom atom groups, um, but we can ignore that. Then for the outputs, um, we do not really need the trajectory in this case, but let's choose to return it. We want to return the growth file. And we want to produce uh, the checkpoint file, which allows us to continue um, the simulation with our subsequent um, equilibration and then the production uh, simulation. So again, we want to produce our EDR output, like for the energy minimization, and um, we want to produce produce the TPR output. Um, that should be enough. Okay, then as for the settings, here we have a choice as to the ensemble, and this is the NVT equilibration. So we select NVT. Again, we have the choice whether to upload our own MDP file or use customizable settings. Um, so if you are already familiar with Gromax and you've used it on the command line, this might be an option that you're um, more interested in. So you can customize things um, more extensively. But um, if you're new to, to Gromax, um, then we recommend that you use, um, that you use the, the customizable settings here. So um, the leapfrog, so the leapfrog algorithm is a good choice um, to integrate it here. For the bond constraints, then we want to um, constrain um, all bonds for the um, position restraints. Um, we can leave neighbor searching and electrostatics as a default. For temperature, let's choose a sensible temperature of 300. Um, step length here is um, a femtosecond. You could also change this, but if you make it much more than a femtosecond, then um, it's likely that the simulation will, um, will fail. So a femtosecond is a good value. And as for the number of steps that elapse between saving data points, um, a thousand is um, probably a good value. Um, these values we can leave as the default. And now um, important is the number of steps for the simulation. So um, we select here 50,000. So if you remember our step length was um, a thousandth of a, piece of a peak of second or a femtosecond. So 50,000 um, femtoseconds is equal to um, an equilibration of uh, 50 picoseconds. And let's um, generate the log. So um, in case the job fails, then um, having access to this log is very useful to help to debug, to find out where things went wrong. So I recommend that you always um, click yes for this option. Uh, 
and now we are starting with with real simulations um you can expect that they take some time so um be prepared for that and um yep no need to be impatient okay the simulation has just finished and just like for the minimization step we want to check that the um, equilibration completed successfully so that our simulation has actually um, uh, equilibrated to a constant temperature so once again we use the Gromax extract energy components tool the, uh, this one and we need to take the EDR file as input this one here and so before we selected uh, potential as a term to calculate, and this one this time because we're interested in the temperature, and then we select um, pretty logically the temperature. And again, we select um, galaxies have begun as the output format. Okay, so the job's finished. We click again on visualize this data. And we can use again the JQ plot line charts just as before. So for x axis, we select column one, and for y axis, column two. And then you should hopefully see this kind of plot where the temperature of the system rises from um, a low value up to around 300 and then it fluctuates um, within two or three degrees um, around the 300 kelvin value and um, if you're seeing something different that um, a stable temperature value is not reached then you should consider extending the length of the um, equilibration but for this system 50 picoseconds should be sufficient but for your own system perhaps a longer equilibration is necessary so just to bear in mind that it's worth checking um, uh, with this tool okay so the next step is to carry out the next um, equilibration step which is um, now under the NPT ensemble So we use very similar parameters to, to, to before. We want to, um, we, uh, we can use the same topology as before, but we want to update the grow file to the one which um, was produced by, um, to the one which was produced uh, by our MUT equilibration. So that would be that one. Um, under inputs, we also want to um, choose the checkpoint file, which was produced by the NVT ensemble simulation. So the idea of the checkpoint file is it contains um, all the information about the um, about the last state of the um, simulation. So, for example, all the forces which are acting on the atoms, and then we can use these to um, to restart our new simulation from the point where the previous simulation left off. Um, for the position restraint, we once again want to select the same file as before. Index, we again leave empty. Um, we want to once again uh, return trajectory and structure outputs, as well as checkpoint and EDR files, and the TPR output. Okay, and then of course we change NBT ensemble to NPT. And um, yeah, here are the same parameters as for the previous equilibration. So we constrain all bonds. Um, we set the temperature to 300 degrees. We set the step length to one femtosecond. Number of steps elapse between, say, data points to 1,000 and 
once again that's um, equilibrate for 50,000 steps. So after having carried out the MPT simulation, then um, we once again want to check the, um, that the pressure of the system has um, converged. So we should expect that it converges on, on, on one bar, so, so atmospheric pressure. Um, and once again, we expect some fluctuation. So this time I will skip this step. Um, of course, I recommend that you try it yourself, but um, just to avoid um, repeating myself too much. Uh, but I will show you the kind of graph that you should expect after plotting the pressure output from the Extract Energy Components tool. So it should look some, uh, something like this. Once again, um, a sharp rise at the beginning and then a lot of fluctuation. Um, so actually this looks like a kind of crazy amount of fluctuation in first glance. So we have, um, we expect the pressure to be at one bar and um, it's fluctuating through the whole of the simulation at something between minus 200 and 200 bars. Uh, but actually this is what we expect more or less. So pressure fluctuates a lot in the MD simulation. And, st and statistically, this is probably not distinguishable from the um, pressure that we are um, targeting of one bar. So this is um, an acceptable outcome, I would say. So now we continue with the production simulation. So we are finally ready to um, do the, um, to perform a longer simulation of the protein without uh, constraints, which we can then go on and use for um, whatever analysis we want to perform. So um, for the topology, we use the same topology as for the equilibration steps. We use the growth file from the NPT equilibration um, for the checkpoint file, we use again the checkpoint file from the NPT equilibration. And important to, to note that the position of the strain file that we use in the equilibration steps is not used this time because this is a production simulation. Then, um, as for the outputs, um, we once again want to return the XTC file and the growth file. And just to note here that in the last two um, equilibration steps, I selected um, the XTC file, but we did not really need to use it at all. Whereas for the production simulation, this is the main output, the main outcome that we're interested in, um, the trajectory. Um, we can produce a checkpoint file, but we will not be proceeding with any further simulations, so it's not strictly necessary. Again, there's nothing to um, uh, check as far as, as, far as the um, EDR file is concerned, but um, it, does, it does not help to, um, to produce it. And I'll produce the, T, the TPR file as well. Okay, so once again, we have the choice of whether to conduct the simulation under the NVT or MPT ensembles. Here I suggest NVT. And um, so this time we uh, leave the bond constraints as the default, so no bond constraints. Uh, temperature, of course, 300 Kelvin. Step length, a femtosecond. number of steps you can set to a million. So six zeros, uh, that is one nanosecond. So let's start the tool. This is of course a longer simulation, so you should expect that it will take uh, some time to complete. All right, so as you can see, the final simulation job has now completed. So you can see these um, four data sets have been produced. Um, I'm sorry, that's actually six data sets in total. And in particular, the important ones are the growth file, which shows the static uh, structure at the start of the trajectory, and the XTC file, 
which um, contains all the frames which make up the trajectory. So what we can do next, and what um, Chris will show you in a few minutes, is how you can then apply various different analysis techniques um, to, to these two files um, to find out some more about how your molecular system um, is behaving during the course of the simulation. Um, but what I would like to show you first of all is how we can uh, scale up this kind of simulation to a really um, high throughput level. And the way that we do that is using two different galaxy concepts called um, workflows and collections. So this part of the tutorial is optional and it's covered by a section at the end of the training material. So if I go back to um, the training material page here, this section, uh, optional automating high throughput calculations. So you can also follow through the instructions, uh, follow through the instructions here. Um, so what I'll start by doing is navigating to the um, to the workflow tab here on the top. Then you see that we have a list of workflows. Um, I will show you the contents of this one, the protein ligand HTMD simulation. So what a Galaxy workflow is effectively is it's a way of connecting up um, multiple tools um, together to form a single pipeline, uh, which you can then run um, as if it were a single tool. So um, these boxes here represent um, two different input files. And the rest of the boxes represent um, uh, different tools. So all the tools that we used so far in the course of the analysis. These um, uh, pipes uh, represent the inputs and outputs of the tools which are being passed in between. So first of all, we, we, we start with an SD file containing um, some ligands they want to perform MD simulations for. Uh, in case you're not aware, um, an SD file is a commonly used file format for, store, for storing chemical information um, for molecules which um, have three-dimensional uh, coordinates. We, we pass it to the um, compound conversion tool, which gets it up into um, a collection. So a collection in Galaxy is um, a group of individual data sets which we can apply the same tool to. Then for each of these, then we run the, the generate MD topologies um, tool, which you already used. We merge the topologies together with these um, protein topologies, which we have generated from the PDB input file. And um, then we continue with all the tools you saw already, structure configuration, solvation, uh, Gromax energy minimization, um, our um, equilibration sim simulations, and finally our production simulation. So just to show you how this works in practice, um, I can click on Run Workflow up here. And I have a history pre prepared here with two input files, uh, three, um, three, three molecules for which I want to conduct um, molecular dynamic simulations and um, the same HSP90 um, PDP file we've been using so far. So then um, you can see the workflow. We have these two inputs. We have our um, PDB input file that we select here and our SD file. And then we have um, various other tools. So these have um, different parameters which we can also adjust. So for example, let's say we want to change the sodium chloride concentration to 0 0.1. Um, the step length maybe to one femtosecond, 0 0.001 picoseconds. And then let's conduct some very short simulations. So um, 1,000 sets um, for MVT simulation, 1,000 for MPT, and um, 1,000 for the production simulation. So very short simulations, but just to demonstrate um, what, uh, what is possible here. And um, then we simply click on Run Workflow here. And what you'll see is that the um, workflow will be, will be scheduled and it will, and it will produce um, a lot of different jobs in the history, which will start off as grey because they're waiting to run. And then gradually um, uh, they'll change colour and eventually become green. And uh, we'll see in the end that, that, that the final output files that we get at the end um, are in Galaxy collections, so in groups of um, three files. So one for each of these three molecules 
which are contained in this um, structured data file. So you can see already that the first few jobs have been scheduled. These um, Chromax initial setup tools um, and this um, initial step, which splits up the, um, the structured data file into um, a collection of Galaxy data sets. So what you can see here is that the entire workflow has been scheduled. The intermediate data sets are hidden. So we can just see these two collections um, at the end, which haven't completed yet. We need to wait until the entire workflow completes. Um, but for example, you can see that if you click on this collection, it will show you the three, um, the three XTC files, which have yet to be produced, but um, which are grouped together in a single collection. So this provides a really neat way in which you can just upload a couple of input files and then um, at a click of a button and after selecting a few parameters, then you can um, run multiple simulations in parallel for a range of different uh, small organic molecules. Uh, the final thing that we can do with workflows in Galaxy is to automate them via the command line. So if you um, look now again at the training material, then you can see that um, we described two different ways that you can do this, one using the Python library BioBend. We provide a um, small Python script, which you can use for this. Or even more simply, you can use the uh, Planemo command line tool um, to just run the um, to just run a Galaxy workflow from the command line in a single command. So this section is strictly optional. If you don't feel comfortable using the command line, then feel free to to skip it. But um, I think it might be interesting for some people, and and it's nice also to show you what kind of things are really possible with Galaxy. So here is my terminal. Um, in this uh, directory, I have two files. I have my um, my struct data file, which contains my ligands. As you can see. And then I have um, this HTMD uh, job file. And what this contains is a um, is a list of workflow inputs um, to run a Galaxy um, to to run a particular Galaxy workflow, and then I can simply run um, a, a planemo command like this. So, uh, planemo run, and I have uh, the workflow ID and my HTMD job file, which I just showed you, and finally. Um, a Planemo profile, which contains all the information which is needed to log into my um, Galaxy account programmatically. So then I just click on Enter. And if I return to my web browser, then I should be able to see that um, a new Galaxy history has appeared. Um, so already the ligands um, file is being uploaded, and uh, shortly the workflow itself will invoke and create all the um, all the datasets that we saw before. Uh, so my aim there was just to show you very briefly um, what kind of thing is possible with with Galaxy, how you can interact with the Galaxy server via the command line, um, to cover all the functionality of Planemo for. Um, for running workflows would um, be subject for a whole different tutorial, but hopefully this provided you with a bit of, with, with a bit of information. If you're interested, then you can go and um, research this yourself and look at the Planemo documentation. All right, so having told you about high throughput molecular dynamic simulation of the galaxy, that brings my part of the tutorial to a close. So I'm going to hand you over to Chris now, who will show you how um, to perform um, the analysis of the um, of the MD files that we've produced uh, using Galaxy. Hi everyone, my name is Chris, and I'll be taking you through the analysis part of this Galaxy tutorial. To start, we'll go through some short background, and then after that, the interactive session. If you have any questions, please do ask us. We will be online to help you out.
So you've already run a molecular dynamic simulation and you found that it produces incredibly large and complex data sets in different file formats. And in this case, you have all the Cartesian positions of each atom of the system under investigation saved out at a particular interval during the course of the simulation. Now, often we'll have tens of thousands or millions of atoms. For example, just considering this enzymatic system on the left, you have an enzyme and a ligand and some ions in a water box. In this case, there will definitely be quite a few thousand atoms and your simulation will have many, many time steps, millions of time steps in order to sample enough of the phase space. So you're often running um, at, at least, let's say, 50 nanoseconds of simulation for, for a decent, um, uh, decent sampling and perhaps more than that. So once you've done this and you have these outputs, these molecular dynamics trajectories, you want to then conduct rigorous analysis of this information rich data in order to obtain scientific insights and conclusions from the simulations. So we're going to look at those analysis tools in this, this talk. So a general outline of the basic process is that you have some inputs, for example, the structure file, which might be in a Gromax format or a PDP format. You'll have your trajectory file or files and also some parameters. So those parameters might indicate which atoms you want to investigate or if you want to change the definition of, let's say, what hydrogen bonding looks like. Um, in terms of angle or distance, you might, you might change these things as parameters. Then we'll go to the part where we take these inputs and analyze them using some kind of molecular analysis framework. So you're going to extract information and transform it in some way. We'll be loading information as well. And <clears throat> as often, often the case, it, there's, there's many frameworks already available. And although you can write your own custom scripts, we recommend, especially for um, workflows and for reusability, to use existing frameworks that are fairly well tested, um, such as MD Analysis, Bio3D, MBTRAJ, and BMD. And what we've done is we've used these frameworks and integrated them into Galaxy. So you can process the data and then your process data, the results of, of doing this analysis is then a table, a graph or a figure or a combination of these. And these are what you would then read into a little bit further and try to figure out what particular property has changed or if the simulation has converged or perhaps if there's some interesting behavior that's worth investigating. Um, and at worst, maybe you'd find out that you, know, you need to run a longer simulation or there's a problem with the simulation that you might not have picked up. So it's very important to look at these with the process data. And of course, this will also help for publication if you've got some interesting um, figures. So some commonly used analyses, I mean, this is a really rich space, so there are many types of analyses. In Galaxy, we've got some of the most common ones that you want to use. So for example, a time series, if you want to look at a property over time. And then if you want to, for instance, look at the root mean squares, we've got, we've got the root mean square deviation or fluctuation. We've also got the principal component analysis. And often people are interested in hydrogen bonding analysis. So if you're looking at an active site of a protein and there's a ligand, you know, are there some interesting hydrogen bonds between the ligand and, and this enzyme over time? Ramachandran plots, if you're looking at the torsion angles of, of proteins, this is quite useful. And there's a few other examples. Now we don't have all of these tools in, in Galaxy just, just yet. So I've started some of those that are not, quite, not available right now. And perhaps you have a favorite package that you'd like to use. So how do you get that into Galaxy? So if it's on Condorforge, it could be added quite easily and you can contact us online to, to add new tools, but we'll be covering some of these more commonly used analyses during, during this tutorial. Okay, so to start off with, let's focus on um, a basic time series analysis. So the idea here is to measure a property over time. So for example, you might want to measure a distance an angle or dihedral angle. You also might want to consider non bonded type interactions like hydrogen bonding. And so hopefully you'd get a time series of your property you're measuring, for example, the end-to-end -end distance versus the frames or the time in the simulation. And <clears throat> while it can be very interesting to look at this, it can also be misleading because we should really do a histogram analysis where possible, um, as we're not counting how many times, you know, in this case, it's the end-to-end -end distance. Um, a particular part of that is sampled. So it, it, these time series are very useful because we can look at, let's, let's say, um, a torsion angle, whether it's sampled phase space you know, relatively well. And if we want to change that, we might run a longer simulation. 
or we might want to run a free energy simulation or potential of mean force. Um, but there are other ways to consider properties, um, but this is just one of the, the um, easy to understand and you know, useful first ways to consider particular properties of interest. And of course, hydrogen bonding um, interactions are very popular to consider. So this is a great, a great time series to use for your analysis. So next up, let's look at the root mean squared deviation or the RMSD. And this is a standard measure of structural distance between coordinates. And it measures the average distance between a group of atoms for example, the backbone atoms of a protein. And why you might want to do this is if you want to check the stability, first of all, and also the conformation of the selected atoms over a simulation. So if you do this for a protein, you could measure the root mean between an initial conformation and all the frames of the simulation. And you'll see that you'll get a time series and a histogram um, using the tool in Galaxy. And if you look over time, you can see the RMSD did fluctuate a little bit. And now we want to figure out um, you know, are there multiple states or is there pr pretty much one stable state? So looking at the histogram, you can see the density. There's a little peak on the left here, but there's pretty much a stable um, state and there are not many confirmations of this protein um, that are worth investigating. There's just one stable state, which is good for the type of um, simulation we happen, uh, we happen to be doing here. So this tool really useful for the purpose indicated over here. So if you want to also look at the fluctuation around a particular residue, you would then use the root mean squared fluctuation or the RMSF, where we look at the average deviation of a particle with respect over time with respect to a reference position. So very useful uh, looking at amino acids in a protein. So if we have, if we look at the plot that's produced in Galaxy, it's the RMSF versus the residue position. And you can see that the fluctuation per residue changes and some residues fluctuate more than the others. So we'll use this kind of analysis to identify the most dynamic areas of the system and see if we want to investigate those further. And often the, the C and the N terminus or the, or the beginning and the end of the protein uh, fluctuate quite a lot and, and we might ignore that. But we're often looking for RMSFs above one, significantly above one, and that would indicate that area is very dynamic and it's moving a lot during the simulation. So if you didn't expect that, that might indicate there's some Confirmational change that needs to be investigated, or there's something wrong with the simulation, um, or maybe something interesting is really happening. So, <laughs> you know, this is another way to consider if if um, the simulation is is going as expected, and if there's an interesting area to consider. Next up is PCA or principal component analysis. So this is a well-known statistical method. It's often used for dimensional reduction, and the reason we want to use it here is we have a molecular system. There are many atoms with Cartesian positions and these change during the course of the simulation. So we have for a Cartesian position, three points X, Y, and Z times the many atoms that we have. And there's a large complexity. There's you know, multi-dimensional complexity. We have this huge space and we want to reduce the dimension. So from whatever dimensionality it is, um, you know, several thousand dimension um, to something that we can understand. And we will use this PCA analysis. So what we do, um, the covariance matrix is calculated and diagonalized to get eigenvalues and eigen, eigenvectors. And these are the, then the principal components. And essentially, these are the um, components. They have the highest variance. So these are the things that are moving around in the system a lot. And they also are um, orthogonal to each other. So they're, not, they're independent. And so we have these, these eigenvectors. And we can consider this movement and say, well, you know, is this interesting? And what, you know, what's going on? So it's really useful to study the essential dynamics of a system using PCA, and we'll be looking then at statistically meaningful motions. So the one of the results that you'll get in Galaxy is this set of plots where the principal component one and two are plotted versus each other, two and three, three and one, and then also this scree plot or um, eigenvalue rank plot. And what's happening here is, let's look at PC2 versus one, the, the amount of variance that this component is responsible for is indicated in brackets. And this is plotted over time from blue, which is the beginning of the simulation, through to red. And you can see over time that the system moved from a positive region of principal component one space to the negative region, um, and then from the negative region of principal, also, sorry, the positive region of principal component two to the negative region to the positive region. So you can f figure out if your system is is going through um, repetitive uh, motions or not, 
and you could sampling this this principal component space in an interesting way. <clears throat> now, of course, these principal components are from a very large molecule, so they will not be as elegant as a simple bond vib vibration. There's often some complexity here, so it's very useful to extract and visualize these components, which you can do in Galaxy, um, and I'll discuss that in, in the um, interactive session. Now, what's often the case is that the, the scree plot um, shows us that you know, only a few principal components are responsible for a lot of the variation in the system. So usually up to five. So one, two, three, four, five, maybe in this case, six or seven, is responsible for about 50% of, of the variance. And those are the ones that we want to consider. So we tend not to consider the principal components out here because they're not responsible for very much of the variance. Okay, so I've discussed all the um, basic analyses that we'll do in this in this tutorial. And just a reminder of the frameworks we're using, MD Analysis, MD Trad, Bio2D, and VMD. You can access the, the training materials on the following website. And in fact, it might be a little bit more convenient on your Galaxy session. If you look at the top bar, you'll see the graduate cap or academic hat icon. If you click, click on that, you'll be able to access the training material. So thanks very much for watching this intro session on analysis. Let's move on to the interactive session. Hi everyone, welcome to the interactive session. So we're going to go through the analysis part of the HTMD tutorial together. And you should go to your favorite instance of Galaxy that has the computational chemistry tools. I'm using usegalaxy.eu and I've gone to the chem informatics subdomain. So it's going to show the, the um, mostly the chemistry tools on the left, the chemical toolbox, as well, well as a few other useful tools, but nothing outside of this domain. So it'll be easier to find the tools we're working with. And we can access the training by clicking on the academic hat over here, and it'll automatically take you to HTMD. And if it doesn't, for some reason, you will just then move to Galaxy Training, Computational Chemistry. You'll scroll down to HTMD, and you'll, set, you'll click on the hands-on, and then scroll down, and we're currently doing analysis, so you'll click over there, and we'll start this section. So before we get started, I just want to clean up my history. So I have a history with some of the setup and some of the analysis going on as well, but it's it's very complicated to look at. So I just want to start with all that we need for this analysis. And what we need is a, a Gromax file, which was created during the final simulation that you did. So that final simulation would have been your production simulation, and it would have produced a number of outputs but particularly we want to get the XTC file for the trajectory and the grow file, which is the structure file. So I'm just gonna take this history that I've got and I'm going to make a new history. So I'm going to history options. I'm going to go to copy data sets and I'm just gonna scroll down and I'm just gonna figure out which one it is. So I think it should be called something similar to Gromax simulation. And I particularly want the data that is the XTC data and the grow data. So you can see in my case, if you click on, on your history item, it'll expand and show you some more information. And in my case, the, the history items that are interesting are number 36, which is the grow um, output from the simulation, and number 37, which is the XTC output. So 36 and 37, um, which are those two over there. And I'm going to copy with just those two to a new history called HTMD underscore analysis underscore 2021 and I'm going to press copy and that'll take a moment and you can navigate that history the usual way but you'll see that there's this pop-up over here that explains um, that you can click on this link so you can just click on that and it'll take you to the new history so we're at this new history and now we can get going and to get started I'm going to again click on the training materials and scroll down to analysis so you've completed the simulation and you might be asking a whole lot of questions like, is it converged and what interesting molecular properties can I observe um, that are relevant um, to, to you know, what's interesting about this, this particular system? So your research on this particular project. So in this case, we're looking at heat shock protein and we're just going to do some basic analyses to get used to, the, to what's available in, on Galaxy. So the first thing um, I want to do here, and, and you'll, you'll do this as well, is create a PDB file. And the reason for that is most of the analyses in, in Galaxy right now would use a PDB file as an input structure. 
and we have a grow format file. There are other ways to do this, but I mean, I find this the best way and um, we're just going to follow along and use the following tool. So we're going to use the Gromax structure configuration tool. And what we're going to do is just convert the PDB file. Sorry, convert the Gromax file to PDB format. So what I've done here is I've actually copied the name of the tool. Just paste it into this tool search section and hopefully you'll find the right tool. So you can see that it's the second hit. So Gromax structure configuration. And then just to make things a little bit easier, um, I'm going to full screen this, this window that I'm in. And for me, I have to press function on F11. For you, that might just be F11 to go to full screen. So I full screened. And what I'm going to do here is use this tool to convert the Gromax um, uh, uh, structure file, which is uh, history item number one. And you can see there it is. It's a Gromax format. And I'm going to output a PDB file. So you have to change the output format. And that's all that we have to do. And if you just want to double check, you'll click on the, the training materials again, and you can see we change the output and the box configuration is set to one. So we don't need any of this detailed information, so I'm just going to press execute. And that will then start on the right hand side in your history. So it's currently waiting in the queue. It's gray and that should start shortly. And um, when it's complete, um, we will then have a PDB file. Now, in the meantime, um, let's while that's waiting, let's move on to the next step. So let's convert the trajectory file from XTC format to DCD, and we'll use this MB trad file converter. Now the job's just started running; it's gone yellow, so it's it's running now. And I'm going to search for MB file converter, and there it is. And the input that's selected is is history item two so by default this converter knows that you know you might be wanting to convert a trajectory trajectory type so xtc or dcd it won't select the other history items and we're going to convert this to dcd now I'm always going to go back to this the, the training materials just to double check i'm doing the right thing yep doing the right thing and i'm going to press execute and you can see that that is now waiting in the queue to run and that the other job that we ran a moment ago the conversion from a grow format to a PDB format has completed. So I'm just going to click on that and just see what that looks like. And you can see the contents of, of this data here is a PDB format. So it's not showing all of it because it's quite a large data set. So we just see the first few lines and you can see, um, you know, there's the first amino acids of alien and all the atoms of the alien and the contingent positions, X, Y, and Z, etc. Okay. So the next job is running. That's excellent. So what happens after we've got these structure and trajectory files is we can actually start the analysis. And the first analysis that we're going to run is an RMSD analysis of the protein. And in this case, we're going to use it to check that you know the simulation, the protein in the simulation is, looks pretty stable. And as you saw previously, this is a standard measure of structural distance. And in this case, we'll use the C alpha carbons of the protein backbone to figure out if, if the protein is stable throughout this trajectory. So we're going to use the RMSD analysis tool. And again, I'm just going to use um, control C, right click and copy as well, just to copy the name of the tool. And we just want to select the domain to be C alpha. And then we should end up with an output like this. So let's just do that and press an escape or rather just clicking on the, the outside of the, the training material area to get back. And I'm going to paste the tool name in. Okay, there it is, RMSD analysis using Bio3D. So the DCD file that we want to use is this fourth history item. Note that we could choose number two and you can see Galaxy would auto convert that XTC to DCD. I personally haven't done it this way. I always use the conversion tools that we've set up in, you know, for computational chemistry. Um, so if you'd like to give it the other way a try, good luck, see if it works. Um, but I recommend doing it this way. And the same for the PDB input choose history item three um, if you've got a new history or as appropriate for, for your history. Then under select domains, you've got a few options and the history and the, the, sorry, the domain we want to choose is C alpha as per the training material. And we don't need any other further um, notification about it. And I'm sure it's clear already, but a lot of these tools have further information about you know, what the tool does, what the inputs are, 
and what outputs you can expect. So you can always read more about these tools, not only through the, the training materials, but also on the tool page itself. So let's execute that tool or execute that job. And you can see it's running, sorry, it's waiting in the queue, it's gray. And at this particular time, there's a whole lot of Galaxy jobs going on on this particular server. So um, while I'm running this, maybe these jobs will be a bit slower than usual. So it's still waiting in the queue. So what I'm going to do is start the next job so long. So that's the protein um, RMSD, and we expect a result like that. And we can also set up the ligand RMSD as well. Okay, and it uses this, the same tool. So it's RMSD analysis tool, the same trajectory and PDB, but we're just going to change the domain. So I hope you can see that the, the RMSD job is running in the background now. There's a yellow um, color over there, which means the job is running. What I'm actually going to do is select, I'm just going to copy the name of this residue ID. So what we're trying to do here is also check if the ligand is stable. Um, and in that case, it's good to choose the ligand atoms and the, the name of the ligand that we have or the residue ID of the ligand is G5E. So that's what we're going to choose. So I'm going to select that. And we're going to use the same tool. So a trick I often use is to use to do the following. Here's our previous job for the protein. It's still running. I'm going to say run this job again. And it uses exactly the same tool. It's exactly the same inputs as you'd selected before. And of course, the, the, the same parameters. I'm just going to change those a little bit. So everything else was the same except the residue. So I'm just going to go down to that residue ID. And I'd already copied of that residue which is G5E um, and if you need to go back you just do so and then I'm going to press execute so those jobs um, one of them is already finished this um, ligand is is now running uh, sorry now waiting in the queue it's, it's gray so that RMSD analysis job for the ligand it's running let's just have a quick look at the RMSD analysis for the protein okay so let's just go back a little bit I did skip ahead um, and see that the output that 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 you get is very similar to to what the um, what is shown here in the tutorial. So we should see some at least two outputs, if not three. And for the RMSD tool, there are actually three outputs. So there's just your tabular data, so it's a time series. Then there's a plot, which is a time series of RMSD versus the frame number. It's effectively over the course of the simulation. And then there's also a plot. Uh, histogram plot, so which then um, takes all the time series data and places it. So this is all the time series data, and it places it in, it bends it over the RMSD. So these, this data looks fairly similar, or these outputs look fairly similar to what's in the training material. And the reason they might be a little bit different is remember that we're running very short simulations because it's a tutorial. Um, when you run a MD calculation, you set a random seed to set the velocities for the atoms at the beginning of the simulation. So we expect that you know there will be some 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 difference. So you might not have exactly the same result as this, but it should be very similar. So what's happening in terms of the time series is that the RMSD is generally staying around one. There seem to be some change. Um, a little bit further on in the simulation that might be worth investigating. And you'll see that then in the histogram plot that it's quite a, a broad region from, you know, I guess from 0.5 to about 1.5. You've got um, a unimodal like distribution, but there is a little bit of an edge over here. But it seems that the protein conformation generally stays fairly stable and averaging around one, although there's this little edge. So maybe in a longer simulation, we would see something interesting going on. And then for the ligand, let's just go a little bit further down. You should, you should have a similar result to this. Then for the ligand, we expect that the ligand will have a stable binding mode um, for, the, you know, for, the, for the length of simulation we're running and, and because this is a well-known system. So you expect nothing um, dramatic to happen. So if we look at these plots, the ligand, again, there's some raw data from that RMSD. Then the RMSD plot, that looks pretty stable. The RMSD is about 0.3 on average, but you know there's some movement. So we can figure out, you know, is that a lot of movement? We need to look at this distribution as a histogram. So 
There we go. Um, so it's centered around 0.3. It's a little bit um, skewed to the right. But generally, this ligand looks like it's fairly stable. It's unimodal distribution, and it's it's stable in the active site. And of course, um, in in conjunction with these analyses, you could also go and visualize the output of these simulations um, to confirm this. But of course, now we have a quantitative measure of the RMSD of the protein and the ligand over time. Okay, so that's the first type of root mean analysis. Next up, we would like to look at the root mean square fluctuation. And it's valuable to consider, especially for the protein, because we can look at the deviation of these amino acids over time and figure out if there's large structural changes or, or large dynamic change at a particular position. So let's use the RMSF analysis tool. And let's search in the left panel. And there it is. And again, the trajectories in PDB should be automatically selected correctly here. And the domain that we want to look at again is C alpha. So this RMSF works really well on proteins, <coughs> excuse me, or distinct residues, or molecules with distinct residues in them, like a protein. <coughs> excuse me again. I'm just going to execute that. And we should have two outputs, the raw data and the RMSF plot. So that is queuing so long. And the expected result of this would be a plot of the root mean square fluctuation versus a residue position. And large fluctuations, we really don't expect any in this calculation. Um, but anything above one would be considered a large fluctuation. Um, and as mentioned earlier, the, you know, the first and last residue tend to fluctuate a lot and be quite flexible. Um, but otherwise, we don't expect this protein to be particularly flexible, especially with the short simulation we're running and um, as it's in a stable conformation. So if it were to be the case that there was a large flexibility, let's say um, you can see around residue 100, there is some flexibility. We could figure out why that is, and perhaps if those amino acids are the ones that are in contact with the ligand, um, or if there's other dynamic motion in this protein, and it might be useful then to visualize the, the protein um, and see what's, ha what's happening there. So I'm just going to click back to the, the output. So in your history, you should have an RMSF raw data, which is then the time series. So for each frame that you've saved from the simulation, just here labeled from one to the end, and then the RMSF is, is calculated. Now that looks as follows. So a little bit different to, to the one in the training material example. Um, and mainly, I guess around residue 100 or so, there's a little bit of a change over here. Um, I don't think that that this is necessarily relevant. Any anywhere around one is considered fine, but you know if you worried if you were to be worried about why this is moving so much at this position, it could be investigated further again via um, a visual analysis or by looking at another time series. Perhaps um, these residue positions, so amino acids at 50 and whatever's near to them to figure out why they're moving around. We might see this in the PCA as well. So um, just a general a general look at this, it's probably okay. This is expected motion for this particular simulation. Okay, so moving on, next up is the PCA analysis um, or principal component analysis. And what we're trying to do here is take all the motions of the system that are statistically meaningful and try and understand what they are. So we're going to look at using this PCA tool, which uh, we're going to choose the C alpha domain of the protein, and we should get something like this. So we'll be able to look at the principal components of, of the protein over time. So I'm going to choose the PCA tool. And there it is. So PCA using Bio3D. And again, your trajectory and PDB input should be the same as before. So in my case, that's history items four and three. The domain to use is C alpha. And there's quite a lot of outputs for PCA. Um, there's a PCA plot, a cluster plot, and then the first principal component plotted versus the RMSF. So that's quite interesting. We can compare the RMSF, which you've already calculated as well, um, to the first principal component, and we'll also get some raw data. So I'm just going to press execute. Okay, so that has been queued. Just waiting for that to run. 
and okay so it's just turned yellow so it started to run so you should expect to have a similar result to this one where the first three principal components are of course of, of very high variance and doing something similar to what we see here so a question you might have though is you know what is the principal component so you don't know what the principal component is it's just the so a group of atoms with the, the highest variance so we're using the the c alpha atoms here so in c alpha which of those atoms have the highest variance and are orthogonal in in motion to the other principal components so you might want to visualize that which we can do and then another thing that we might want to do is look at the cosine content um, and this calculation gives you some idea if your simulation is converged or not. We don't expect the simulation to be converged, so I'll run that in, in a moment. So we have the four PCA outputs, the raw data. Okay, so this is for the first three principles, if I, if I recall correctly. Then you've got a PCA plot, which is what's shown in the, in the tutorial. We'll come back to that in a moment. There's also a cluster plot, so by default, the number of clusters to look out for is two. And in this case, um, perhaps three would have been a, a better choice for PC2 versus PC1. Um, but it's the same as the previous plot, but color coded differently because it's clustered rather than um, over time. So here it's color coded over time. So blue is at the start and red at the end of the simulation. And then the fourth output then is PC1 versus the RMSF. So you can see there are some similarities, they're not identical but there's some similarities between the first principal component and the root mean square fluctuation. Okay, so let's just, um, before having a look at the cluster plot, let's start up the next um, calculation, which is the cosine content. So I'll start that up. It just needs the trajectory and the structure file, and we'll give an indication of whether or not the simulation is converged. So let's do it on the first three components and we're gonna um, analyze the first component. Um, and in this case, the tool uses a zero based index. So zero is the first principal component. So we've, that's a zero over there. So we can just press execute and this will result in a cosine content value. So while that's queued and running, we can maybe discuss what's happening with this PCA analysis. If you have a look at your PCA plot, um, you'll see PC2 versus 1. So over time, there's movement from, from PC1 in its negative um, region to a positive region, and the same for PC2. It moves from negative to positive and actually back again. Based on what's happening in these plots, you could decide if it is some kind of repetitive motion or not. And you can look at the sampling of that principal component space. And then you'll also see in, in your screen plot the proportion of the variance. So you can see that the first three components are responsible in total for about 35% of the variance. So the, the first component is 18%. You can see it over here and on the screen plot. And the second component for 11% and together 30%, etc. So those first three components are, are really um, showing you the majority of the movement. Now the question is, what is that movement? Um, so the next tool that we're going to run after this cosine content is a tool that would save out the principal components. Um, let's say the first one, and we could we could then visualize that and, and see what the motion is. So let's start that up as well. We'll go to the training. And this is the PCA visualization tool. So if you use this tool, over here so the third one down again the same trajectories and structure the same selection so if you've used a, a specific selection in your pre in your pca analysis please choose the same one here so we chose c alpha so keep that same selection and let's say we want to look at the principal component the first principal component pc1 so we we choose execute and this will result in a pdb file which is actually a number of has a number of structures in it over time so it's a little bit like a trajectory, but just it's a PDB file. And this file can then be downloaded and viewed using your favorite um, visualization tool. And then you can figure out what that first principle component looks like. So um, for example, 
you can see in this case the motion for PC1 in the simulation that we ran for the training looked as follows. So that was the principal component we found. And again, because this was run on a short simulation, um, it's it's probably you know we need to run we need to run a lot of simulation to confirm this. But you can see that the principal component here is quite complex, right? It's not just a vibration of a single bond. There's a whole lot of things going on there. You can see there's a bit of a wagging motion at the back. Um, and your, in your case, you might see a slightly different motion. So once again, I've jumped ahead. Um, and we did run this PCA cosine content calculation. And let's have a look at what that, that did. So your cosine content, you should get a number. And if we look at the outcome of the PCA cosine content calculation, um, you should get a number around 0.93. And that should indicate the simulation hasn't converged. And the tricky thing with those PCA cosine content, when it's close to one, it indicates the simulation is not converged and a long, longer simulation is needed. For values below 0.7, we can't make a statement about the convergence. So um, we can never know definitely that we've converged um, unless we use a different type of simulation. So free energy simulation, we could converge over a particular degree of freedom. So if we if you have a look at your results, um, my result happens to be 0 0.093, which is a little bit unexpected. So it's a value below 0 0.7. Um, and then what that means is I cannot make a statement about the convergence or lack thereof. But it's it's not that it's not converged. It's just that I can't make a statement about it. Um, and in this case, I mean, you know, it's a short simulation, so I expect to need to run a longer simulation. You should have a similar number. Perhaps your number will be closer to one. And and again you then would be able to say whether it's definitely not converged or whether you're unsure effectively. OK, so that's the cosine content. Uh, and we've already considered this visualization. So finally, let's look at hydrogen bonding anal analysis. And yeah, these are really worth investigating and in particular persistent hydrogen bonds. And so in this case, we will look at the, the protein and the ligand and look at hydrogen bonds that potentially form between them. And we're going to use the hydrogen bond analysis tool using the VMD. So I'm just going to click out and go to that tool. There you go. So it happens to be the first hit for me. And there might be some other tools as well. There's another tool that doesn't use VMD. We're going to use the one that uses VMD. And then you might notice at this time that your, your history items that are selected by the tool are not the correct ones. So the DCD output, uh, the DCD input is correct, but the PDB grow input is incorrect. And the reason for that is we ran that PCA visualization and that created a PDB file. So the tool's chosen the most recent PDB um, data set, and that makes sense, but it's not the one we want. So either choose the correct one, which is in my case, number three, the one we've always been using, right? And you might've seen um, that cool trick that you can do where you can pull these items in like so. So you could also do it that way. And then what we're going to do here is select the protein as the first selection and the ligand as the second selection using the VMD selection notation. So the protein is going to be put into selection one and for selection two, I've copied and pasted rig name G5E. This is simply the ligand. If you have a more complex system, these selections will probably not be appropriate. So for example, if you're looking at an antibody system with an antigen where both systems are proteins, then you'd have to start being more um, specific about your selections. So you can see for the protein, we were pretty lazy. We used, VMD understands what a protein is. We have one protein in the system. So this well, this makes sense. And in terms of the ligand, we, we want a specific ligand. We don't want to select the waters. We don't want to select anything else. So we're using the res name um, to be more specific. And um, there's nothing else that needs to be done there. So that should just work. And we can press execute. So if you find that your result for, for this tool is really odd, um, the tool runs, but there's no result, that will usually mean that you've chosen the you know a data set that doesn't really work. So for example, if I've chosen the, this PCA PDB data set by mistake, 
Um, the other reason that might not work is is to think about you know, the selections that you've, you've you've used and perhaps those are not the correct selections to use. So you could figure out um, using a visualization aid um, the number of these tools, you could figure out which selection is more appropriate to, to use. OK, so that ran pretty quickly and um, there are three outputs. So we've got the percentage occupancy, the number of hydrogen bonds as a time series. So starting at zero, um, the zeroth frame all the way to the end, how many hydrogen bonds are identified per frame. So in this case, one in the, the zeroth frame, two in the first, none in the second, etc. And then the other output is actually just a log file from BMD. So the most interesting one uh, for now is the occupancy. And this should agree with the what's in the tutorial. We should see that there are six hydrogen bonds identified and two of them are quite interesting. And four of them are not very interesting. So the ones that are interesting have a high occupancy. So the side of the ligand, so G5E, and the side of that ligand is a donor atom, which then the acceptor for the hydrogen bond is aspartate, and the occupancy is 79% or so. And that means that that hydrogen bond is around for, or occurs for most of the simulation. And the same for this other hydrogen bond. So again, the ligand, the side of the ligand, but this time with glycine. And you'll recall that glycine you know, has a side chain that doesn't have an acceptor. So you can see here it says main. So this is probably the carbonyl group of, of the glycine. Um, so it's the backbone of, the, of that glycine. And that occupancy is about 29%. So the occupancy just tells us that this hydrogen bond occurs for a certain percentage of the simulation that we've, um, that we've run. And in fact, for a certain percentage of the frames that we've saved out, and doesn't actually say whether or not this hydrogen bond is is consistent throughout, you know, a certain number of frames. So, it, so this could mean, let's say, that the the thirty percent or the twenty nine percent hydrogen bond over here occurs for twenty nine percent of all the frames that we looked at, but it doesn't mean that it could occurred for the first thirty percent of the frames, and then it wasn't there. So we might want to look at a correlation function and figure out, you know, whether or not this um, hydrogen bond is stable. And, and it occurs for long periods of time or if it's flicking on off. We're not going to do that today, but that's something that, that could be considered. If we look at the other hydrogen bonds, the ones with a low occupancy, the reason they're not interesting is they probably not, they don't occur for a long time and they're unlikely to be um, stable, but nevertheless, um, they could be investigated further. So there's the asparagine um, of this protein with the ligand, the threonine with the ligand, the lysine with the ligand, and then ligand with the serine. So, your result then should agree with what is in the tutorial and you can see that um, the glycine and the spartate have high occupancy which is what we found and then the others have a lower occupancy okay so th that's that from the analysis side you've already gone through the high throughput um, calculations with simon and in conclusion, throughout this tutorial, you've looked at a protein ligand system, you've performed molecular dynamics using Galaxy, and you've actually also then looked at the output. So what is going on with this particular calculation? What is meaningful? We've used various forms of analysis, so RMSDs, PCA, we've looked at hydrogen bonding, and you should feel familiar with the basic level um, of MD analysis techniques and, and MD simulation tools. Congratulations, you finished the Galaxy HTMD tutorial. If you do have any further questions or, or any issues that you're having, please do find us online. We are happy to help you out. Thank you. Cheers.